if you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. Have you heard it before? I have read it in your book. Yeah. And I remember that it says that you said this before you knew that it was from the, the testimony. That's right. That was Jesus who said that, not me. <laughs> he knew it 2,000 years ago. But you said it also. Yeah, I said it, you know, but I thought that I invented it. And then I saw that somebody 2,000 years ago knew it also <laughs> and said it in a very good way. Yeah, it was very funny. In this room, I have three people in here, you know, and then I have my book here that I write down who comes and who pays. So I have a list here of all the people who are coming, and then when they pay, I write down afterwards, I will pay, you know, that they have paid, and some that I don't charge them, then I put a little round thing around them, for instance. Jill Harris, she only pays every other time. I told her she has to come more, and then she couldn't afford it, and I said, I would do her once for free, and once she has to pay. And this one is, uh, it is Jackie Lee. She has no money, so I don't pay, she doesn't pay. Then I make a round thing around it so they don't need to pay. But so I have all my information. It's really in this book. So if they don't have any money, they don't have to pay? No. Don't. If they need the, if they need the treatments, they get the treatments. And they some This is Marion Rosen's voicemail. Hello? Well, sometimes I would, my older brother and sister, they would build a sand castle. And I would go and stamp on it, you know. So they just had built it, and I jumped on it, and it was all destroyed. I had very black hair at that time. And I was quite mischievous, I guess. And this is what, how I got the name. We moved from the, our city place out into the country. And that I absolutely loved. And we stayed there uh, both winter and summer I was 13 years old. And that, that was wonderful. It was close to the woods, but we also had a, a, a garden where we had roses and another garden where we had vegetables.
I was with somebody on a trip and a walk to one of the mountains there and came back. And my mother had broken her leg and somebody had helped her to put something on it, could have cast on it or whatever. And this woman was Lucy Haya. And she was teaching massage and breathing. And as I had asthma as a child, I've always been interested in breathing. And my mother said, meet this person. She is doing this kind of work. It might be interesting. When the first time I came there and I had a migraine headache and she put her hands on me and the migraine went away. And that's when I said, I want to do this work for the rest of my life. And she said, if you want to know that, I will teach you. And it was very special because at that time, nobody was supposed to teach Jewish people something. And she took it upon herself to teach me, but anyway, she offered it. And I had immediately felt I would like to be with this woman. And then it was years later, 35 years later, that I tried to teach what I had learned there. And, but then things happened that had not happened before with Mrs. Haya. So it became something different. And what it became is what's now called the Rosen Method of bodywork. I was in a home where I had, was teaching. There were many people in it, and they all cried. And it was like in a nursery, you know. There was no reason to cry. But we went to a place here at the neck, you know, the muscles, where they were tight, holding back. And when it loosened up, they started to cry. And then after they had cried, they felt so much better. I make the contact with the palm of my hand and then with the fingers I feel where I feel some tightness and then go in deeper. The next thing was, I guess, that we looked or what we found out that it was not that they only cried, but they often remembered something that they had experienced that had been very hurtful. And another thing, too, that it had happened to them and they had never told anybody about it. When you are being touched this way, something opens up. And so getting in touch with it and talking about it seemed to make a great difference. And very often after that happened, to my, our great surprise, people would lose their pain. This is what I don't understand up to now either. But this is actually what happened. When they do not suppress what went on with them and they talk about it, very often their pain goes away. It's our breathing muscle, and it goes around in the middle of our body. We don't see it from the outside. We can only feel it a little bit under the ribs. And it has a movement, it's like a copula, and the movement is like this. And it's sort of, when it goes down, the, the air pressure in the chest is smaller, and so the air comes in. And then it comes up, and the air comes out. 
So it's really a, a very important breathing muscle. And when it moves, the, body, the whole body work at its best. And when it doesn't move, the body does not work very well. Then also it has two different uh, nerve systems. One is under our control, the motor one. We can breathe voluntarily, but there's also the other breathing. That is what we are interested in, the breathing that is always there. And that, you know, is very much connected to our feelings. And so when we feel something, we always notice it in the breathing and in the movement of the diaphragm. It's really an indicator of what goes on in the person. This would be the area of the diaphragm where I know. No. And of course I cannot see the diaphragm because it's only on the inside. I feel tightness wherever I go in deeper. It's where the holding is. But it's let go for a lot already. But of course, what is interesting about it is that they're very often when the diaphragm lets go and goes at ease, that they often remember things that has happened to them. I'll tell you one which I think is, is so long ago, so it should be safe. She had migraine headaches for 30 years, every day. And I asked her what happened there. And she said she fell off the bicycle. And then I told her that, you know, when you fall off the bicycle, sometimes you are sore for a while, but you're not sore for 30 years. And you don't have a headache for 30 years. I asked her whatever happened, and then she said, um, said that she had broken up with her boyfriend. And I thought that was it, but then she still didn't breathe. So when she doesn't breathe, I know it's not the real thing. Because when it's the real thing, people start breathing. And then she said, all of a sudden, she said, um, I had an abortion at that time. And then she started breathing. And then when she started breathing, she also started crying. And then she said, and I said to her, what did your boyfriend say about it? And she said, I never told anybody about it. It is just the first time I talked about it. And then she cried even more and said, every day of my life, I've been talking to this being that was my child and that I gave up. And I just feel that I've missed, I missed so much, and I miss her so much, or him so much. And then she cried a bit more, and then the diaphragm, you know, then she started breathing, and started breathing deeply, and that, of course, when the diaphragm moves, when you breathe that way, you know, then you let go. And that happened for a little while, and then that was all. And she got up and then she said, oh, my head. And the headache was gone after 30 years. The first time that the headache was gone. I think I told you about that vision I had a long time ago, this woman in the sky that says, I looked after you. That was the day before the crystal night. The whole sky had a picture of a woman, with a woman's face. And the woman said, don't worry, I will take care of you. 
that was all. And I had that feeling I'd be taken care of. I don't have to worry. And that feeling never left, left me somehow. You know, it was a very scary time at the time in Germany. And then all of a sudden, not to be afraid anymore with anything that happened. There was a ping pong player. You know, there was a very good ping pong player at that time. And I had a partner I played with. And I think I also told you I had to go to the Gestapo for an interview. When I, I came back to Germany in order to say goodbye to my family, and you were not supposed, as a Jew, you were not supposed to come back. I came from England at that time and came back to Germany and then wanted to go from there to America. I had applied to go to America, but I had to wait for quite a long time until I got the visa. And uh, I did get in, and I don't know why they let me in. I had a big J, you know, in my passport, means true. But they let me come in. But then when I wanted to leave again, they found out that I had been away and come back. And so I had to go there. And I don't know why they had to go there. Anyway. And um, it was a fairly scary situation to go to the Gestapo. And I didn't know what it was about. But when I went in there, I saw somebody that I knew. And I saw this partner I played with there as part of the Gestapo. And I got angry. That was the only feeling I had. Not fear or anything, but I was furious to see that this person had become one of the Gestapo people. And they got scared. They got scared of me. And so they just couldn't get rid of me fast enough. They said, it's all right, it's all right. Then we can go now. And then, and then I left. But it was again this feeling, nothing bad can happen to me. Whatever I do, wherever I go, it was all right to come to this country without any money and $500 in debt, not knowing where I would land, what was going to happen, Just, and not be afraid. A very interesting thing is when we have somebody who is very happily married and everything is fine, but they feel they cannot get close to other people. And then I work very often behind the heart and feel there is some protection there in hardness, which they really don't need at this point. And then I sometimes ask them, did you have an, another relationship that before that and they say very often yes we did and how was that well it was very bad and so we broke up and it was very bad so that was the time when they started protecting themselves but then after they broke up they did not remember to let go of their protection so that even after years of uh, feeling good and having a good relationship, this other feeling of having to protect is still there. 
And this is where we can help people to make them aware that they are still protecting themselves and it does not belong to what happens now. Because now they have a good time in a relationship and this old one does not apply anymore. And when they get that, then a change takes place. Apparently, the touch is very important. It is a connection that you make with them. And they, while you, while you have your hands on them, I cannot even say working on them, but just having the hands on them. And so having the hands on the places where they hold themselves away, where they protect themselves, where you sort of ask that protection to, to go away, to, to ease up, to open up. Most of the contact comes from the palm of the hand, that we really make a contact. And the first touch seems to be the most important. And we put the hand on and make the contact. And then the fingers are there to find out where the other parts of tightness are, how far the tightness goes. So we get a picture where the tension could be and what it could mean. But we do not ask and we do not tell people. This is just we, as a practitioner, try to find out. But when we tell people about it, it doesn't help them. It has to come from them. They have to get in touch, in touch, with what is going with them. By our touch, they get in touch with what goes on. And it's amazing the memories that come up for people that they didn't know that things had happened to them. Well, there was one person who came and she was supposed to have a hip replacement. Before she had the hip replacement, she thought she would come to me because she had heard sometimes that something different happened when it worked. And so I worked with her and worked on her hip and in her life. So I asked questions, you know, what's going on in your life and everything. And everything was fine in her life. There was nothing that she felt was bad. And then all of a sudden, she said she started to have tears in her eyes. And then I asked her, but did you know that you are crying? You know? And she said, I'm not crying. And I said, it's pretty bad around here. And then she cried. And then she told me something she had not told me before, that she was a psychiatrist and she had trained somebody, a pupil that she very, thought very much of. And he had done something very non-ethical. And it hurt her very much. And she was very, very sad about that. And this was all, and then she stopped. She got up and was leaving, but she forgot her cane. And so I said, don't you want to take your cane? And then she said, my hip, it doesn't hurt anymore. And it was gone, the pain was gone. And now she is 97 years old, and she still didn't have a hip replacement. And sometimes it hurts, and then she would come, and I would work on it or give her some movement. She never needed a hip replacement. I knew that at a fairly early age. <clears throat> I knew, for instance, if there was a couple, if they liked each other or didn't like each other. And I know that my father always asked me which of the, his people that he worked with he could trust and who not to trust. And he would always 
act accordingly, whatever I said. So there was something, apparently, that was obvious to me. I more or less, I thought that everybody felt that way. Didn't think it was special. You know, I think it's something different than intuition. I think intuition is more to, uh, connected to the intellect. We talked about this a lot among us. You know, if, if that would be intuition, but that's different, different from the knowing. Intuition is yes or no. Knowing, there's no question about it. That is not with the head. It comes from somewhere else, and we do not know where the somewhere else is. But for instance, when I work now, I know where my, to put my hands. I cannot think I should put my hands there, but the hands go there. And it comes from the inside here, goes through the arm and goes through the hand. There's something within me that seems to know. It's right here, some holding. And some people have it and can understand it and can use it, but others don't. So that I talk like something that's absolutely not within their, within their possibilities, you know, that is not there. This inner knowing is not what can be taught, but to how to work in that way can be taught. To work with your hands, make contact, open up, a lot of it can be taught. One little drop in a fight for peace in the world. Like in our classes now, that we have people from about five or six different countries to come. And this is my, my vision, that it will be at more than one place that people where there is where there is hate and aggression, where it can turn into understanding and peace. That instead of yelling at each other or being like this, that it's all right to have your hand over there or help somebody, touch them, be with somebody in a different way. It's also a feeling that comes from you of openness that other people also feel that. That you like to be around somebody. We have heard that there's so nice people to be around. And they have this openness, this streaming out of goodwill towards others. <laughs> 